Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the Antitrust Law section of the American Bar Association. My name is Derek Jackson. Today's episode is titled, Leveling the Playing Field Part 2, the European Union's regulation on foreign subsidies distorting the internal market is now in force. As the title suggests, this is a follow-up to episode 190, released in October 2022. In that episode, we discussed the EU's then new, but not at the time operating, Regulation on Foreign Subsidies, or FSR. The FSR empowers the European Commission to intervene where EU market participants are the recipient of state aid or subsidies from non-EU states that distort EU markets. Now that the FSR is in force and operating, we wanted to revisit the topic and get the perspective of a practitioner on how the regulation is working and what is to come. This episode will address the Commission's ex officio tool and some specific complaints that have been reported in the press, the FSR's impact on mergers, as well as practical tips for companies who are required to comply with the new regulation. My co-host today is Matthew Hall. Hello, Matthew. Hi, Derek. And Matthew, who's our guest today? Our guest today is Ulrich Scholtes. Ulrich is a partner at law firm Gleis Lutz. He advises clients on European antitrust and state aid law, as well as on merger control and general European law, including, of course, the foreign subsidies regulation, which we're discussing today. He represents German and foreign companies before the European Commission and national competition authorities, and has litigated more than 60 cases before the courts of the European Union in Luxembourg. Hello, Ulrich. Hi, thanks for having me on your show. Well, thank you very much for coming on. As Derek mentioned, this is a follow-up episode to number 190, where we initially looked at the foreign subsidies regulation. Could you outline for us what the European Commission has set out for itself. Yeah, sure. Uh, The basic idea behind the FSR is, I think, a very legitimate concern. The EU, and you discussed this in the previous excellent podcast, by uh, together with Andreas Reindl, um, uh, the EU uh, wants to close a perceived regulatory gap, which results from the fact that the state aid rules in the treaty only apply to EU member states. And you don't have a similar control mechanism for subsidies granted by third countries. As an example, the Chinese government can basically freely inject huge amounts of capital into a high-tech company which is active in Europe, uh, a company which makes investments, buys up companies, and which applies for public procurement contracts. So the EU governments, they are subject to a strict discipline. They are bound by the very rigid state aid rules, which often makes life for them difficult. So all what the FSR aims for is to abolish this imbalance and they intend to create a level playing field. You have uh, exactly three tools, three far-reaching instruments to tackle distortions caused by foreign subsidies. First, a notification-based merger control regime to examine certain M&A transactions. Second, a notification-based tool to investigate certain bits in public procurement procedures. And third, a general catch-all tool to investigate on an ad hoc basis all other market situations on the Commission's own initiative, so the the so-called ex officio tool. We'll look at the ex officio in a minute, Ulrich, but looking at the three tools and the end of an investigation, what is the the basic substantive test the Commission will be asking itself 
in the event of a notification or an ex officio investigation? Yeah, that's uh, the most important question, obviously. <laughs> and here on this point, the new regime is unfortunately very brief when it comes to this substantive test. Under the FSR, the commission will carry out a case-by-case -case assessment, taking into account any positive effects in line basically with the EU's broader policy goals. This sounds a bit like um, Pandora's box or maybe it is more a black box. The section in the form you have to fill in, um, 7.1, is extremely short here. Some guidelines on this question might come next year at the earliest. The form does not give a single concrete example of which effects are eligible for consideration here in this test. The commission seems to take the view that this is left to the imagination of the parties and that the burden of proof is completely with them. We expect the commission will mainly look at the EU's broader policy goals, for example, the Green Deal or digital transformation and so on. And this gives the commission very, very broad discretion. They might also look at the vast body of EU state aid law, in particular at all these guidelines which um, exist for all types of state aid, like energy, environment, R&D, state aid, risk finance guarantees, semiconductors, and all these type of things. However, uh, such an analogy to the state aid rules only works to a limited extent. For example, R&D aid, which the Commission looks usually very favorably, is based on the principle that companies invest in a project which leads to innovation, employment, and so on, and therefore the project can receive public support. But this model does not really work if a Chinese company buys up European players with the help of Chinese state money. So um, in these M&A scenarios, such benefits associated with R&D activities are more difficult to detect. Yeah, so broadly, it's a balance between any negative effects of a distorted subsidy, which are found against positive effects. But as you say, it's not clear as, the, as we record today exactly how that's going to play out. Um, very quickly, Ulrich, on remedies... Uh, ultimately, what kinds of remedies do we think the Commission might seek to impose? I know it has a very broad ability to do that in principle. Yeah, that's a difficult one. And most practitioners expect negative decisions or prohibitions to be very rare. Um, this is based on, 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 like you said, like experience and merger control, but also state aid. Um, they will only probably adopt very few prohibitions, but they will accept commitments in order to remedy um, competition concerns. And here, the same problems um, as with a substantive test in general occur. So um, I think uh, for a start, as you said correctly, the Commission has very wide discretion, like under state aid, like under merger control rules. They could request divestments or excess type behavioral remedies like they did in the financial crisis when approving state aid. They might also require that a company reduces capacity or its market position, its market presence. I think one major source where the, where the Commission will probably draw some inspiration from are the rescue and restructuring guidelines. Um, where they have used remedies quite a lot and also in the COVID crisis. Let's see what they make out of it. I want to turn Ulrich to the ex officio uh, tool, the third tool that you mentioned. This is the Commission's ability just to start its own investigation. So separate from the required notification of certain mergers and acquisitions and certain situations where there's a public procurement process. Um, it's interesting that there's been a lot of press uh, about certain uh, so-called complaints where third parties are trying to get the Commission to start an ex officio investigation. All of these seem to be so far in the professional football or soccer world. 
uh, by La Liga from Spain against PSG uh, and others. Uh, I think the commission recently said, however, these aren't really a top priority for us. We're going to have to look at the notifications first. So what do you think is going to happen in relation to these football complaints uh, and ex officio complaints, stroke investigations more generally? Yeah, first about the football, I think everybody was sort of surprised. I think um, four cases are now ongoing, probably more um, about these first cases that they all... Um, are on football basically and certainly the commission did not expect that uh, when they drafted the regulation they didn't have any football cl clubs on the radar and i think today um uh, they said also that this would as you said not be a f the first priority um I am personally a bit pessimistic whether the ex officio tool will be a game changer under the state aid rules, we have in the past submitted loads of complaints for our clients. And in many cases, the commission just did not have enough resources to investigate them. It's quite interesting. In March, um, uh, Director General Olivier Gerson, he said very openly, we will have severe problems with the enforcement of the FSR and said it's Explicitly, um, it's challenging enough to control state aid, but state aid given in Beijing, that is huge in terms of resources. I think that sums it up quite nicely. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to invest these cases, uh, investigate these cases um, in uh, foreign language, in Chinese or something. I don't think, given that these practical these practical problems exist. I do not think this will play a major role, this tool in the commission's um, fight against subsidies. And they will be just frankly, they will be flooded with cases, M&A transactions at the beginning. Yeah, well, let's look at M&A transactions. Um, of course, as competition or antitrust lawyers, we're used to merger control worldwide. We're now very used to FDA, foreign direct investment control, as a parallel track. Certainly now in the larger cases, we also need to think about uh, the, the, uh, the foreign subsidies regulation that we're talking about today. Um, how do you see the interaction between, at least at the EU level, merger control filings and the FSR, or these or are these going to be completely parallel and independent processes with with law firms just having to do these things and just effectively have another team working on it? Yeah, I think life will be more complicated um, and our clients are experiencing this already we have in a transaction like uh, three work streams basically multiple filings in mergers the fsr track and then of course multiple filings in foreign direct investment fdi so um we know the commission is sort of striving for convergence between the merger control track and the fsr track but this um, convergence only exists, I think, as far as like jurisdictional questions are concerned. For example, the notion of concentration is very similar. Control, the notion of control is the same. Ownership, uh, the notifying parties, the definition is pretty similar. Um, also, the procedures are very much alike. Um, you have waivers, you have pre-notification contacts and so on. But, but I think still uh, the potential synergies we have between these two work streams, murder control and FSR, are very limited. Both regimes they have very different objectives in the end. The questions in the form are, in terms of substance, very different. So this is at least our first impression. Yes, that's an interesting practical analysis there, Ulrich. Um, we've mentioned complaints in the context of the ex officio, uh, or trying to get the commission to start ex officio investigations. Of course, complaints are, are often a, a, a big issue in merger control. When there's an FSR merger filing under the 
the, the, the notification tool. Do you think complainants will be will be big in that process as they are in merger control? I think so, yes, definitely. They will use their, com their position, the competitors as a third party for strategic purposes, like they did, as you said, in merger control and state investigations. They will make uh, critical submissions. Um, they will demand far-reaching commitments, of course, and as you know, I mean, such opposition by, by so-called vocal complainants can make your life very difficult as a notifying party. It can drive the process into phase two and, of course, significantly delay the closing. So in our experience, the commission pays very great attention to third-party submissions. Also, of course, because these competitors, they third parties, they can challenge a final decision in the courts in Luxembourg. Yeah, and I mean I, that will mean I think that by definition, complainants under the FSR will need to understand what the Commission's analysis is going to be or should be in terms of balancing a distortive subsidy against the positive effects and also potential remedies. So they'll need to start making submissions on those issues, which are clearly different from what you would normally see in a merger complaint. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So looking at practicalities um, in a bit more detail, the Commission has published, as, you, as you've mentioned, Ulrich, the notification forms and the, and, the, and, the, and the draft and the implementing regulation, which sets out essentially how this works in practice for, for parties. Um, so the background to the law itself. Um, when the draft implementing regulation came out earlier in 2023, there was a big backlash against the amount of information that was going to be required, the form it was going to be required in. Uh, and then, of course, the Commission subsequently published its final implementing regulation. How uh, has that gone down in your view? Well, I, I think it's fair to say the Commission has listened to the uh, different stakeholders in the consultation process. I mean, the criticism was very harsh, but they have reduced the amount of information that must be provided in the forms. So um, detailed information you only need to report for the bigger financial contributions of a certain kind. These are the most likely distortive subsidies, uh, which are listed in Article 5.1 of the FSR. Um, detailed information um, must be provided in relation to these contributions, these um, high-risk um, subsidies or financial contributions. But for other ones, um, the details are not required. Um, we have a different table for that, uh, an overview table. Um, however, that is just... Um, easing of the reporting obligation and it is important to bear in mind that these simplifications they have no impact on the obligation to notify so you always have to establish whether you trigger the thresholds and you have to notify um, if you in particular go above these 50 million FFC um, financial contribution threshold for M&A deals. Yeah, that's a very important point. I think we should emphasize, Ulrich, um, there's a distinction between uh, the jurisdictional test, uh, which includes, as you say, partly the total financial contribution, if we're looking at mergers that the parties have received, and what needs to be actually notified to the commission if the jurisdictional test is met. And then, of course, there's another issue of which of those financial contributions are a subsidy and which give rise to a problem. So there's kind of a, a various layers to this. Um, what are you doing with your clients uh, at the moment in terms of collating financial contributions in order to um, get them ready for for, for transactions and potential procurement uh, uh, situations? Yeah, I think first it is important to really establish an internal monitoring system to co collect all the requested uh, information on a global level, on a group-wide level, 
for the last three years. At least these companies, um, which can basically foresee um, or cannot rule out that they have to make an FSR filing within the next two years, they should kick off this process rather sooner than later. In transactions, of course, you should um, evaluate the potential impact on the deal risk and on timing. You have to include in your SPA a potential FSR filing clause in uh, also in the condition precedents and um, yeah you have to include some cooperation provisions in the spa of course um, a bit like um, the murder control clauses um, we have for for many many years a long stop date and um, maybe also as a lot of parties do a uh, helland high water clause what happens um, to which extent are you obliged to enter into commitments and uh, finally of course you have to prepare yourself for the sub for the for the discussions uh, in terms of substance so this can be on a number of levels first um, you can uh, argue that the financial contributions like you just said they do not amount to a subsidy in many cases you might be able to show that these measures you're talking about do not entail any economic benefit, for example, you can um, hire an economist uh, to support you here um, and you can base, base such a line of argumentation on the case law of the courts or on the many commission, uh, many, many commissions um, on, on the soft law, basically. And second, um, even if these measures qualify as subsidies, you can prepare potential arguments why they are not distortive this can be again supported by the body of case law by the eu courts and by the commission's own decision making practice and of course economic arguments are you finding um ulrich that this sort of data and information that has to be collected is something that companies already collect in the ordinary course of business or does this sort of impose a new burden on them that they weren't um, sort of maintaining this information in one place in this way before? It's a new burden. A good question. Yeah, it is uh, basically not um, readily available. It's about all our clients who do this exercise experience. So it's not in your um, accounting systems. It's not in the um, in the software in, uh, which you usually use because the categories are very much different and it is um, an uphill struggle. Yeah, it is. It's a new challenge. Yeah. Is there a particular challenge you see for, and this was a discussion at the time of the, the implementing regulation draft, for or any differences for PE firms and other financial companies? Well, um, there is now um, in the forum some special provision on PE, on financial investors, but this is a quite complicated, and as you said before, um, it is something which only um, affects the filling in of the form, basically. So what you have to um, report. Um, basically, the principle is um, PEs don't have to report in all detail if the acquiring entity is subject to the EU directive on alternative investment fund managers or similar legislation and if there are no or very limited economic or commercial links between the fund that controls the acquirer and the other funds here and to to prove that that is already something um, and uh, the benefits therefore of, of this simplification are, are rather limited. You still have to notify if you trigger the 50 million threshold, it's just a softening of reporting requirements and yeah, quite complicated um, provision. That's helpful. Um, Ulrich, before we turn to our final part of the uh, of our session here today, I wanted to zoom out a bit again. Um, we've been talking a lot about the detail and the practicalities, which is obviously very important. But the the foreign subsidies regulation doesn't exist in a vacuum. 
There's all, there are other rules about subsidies uh, relate, that the EU has already, the anti-subsidy regulation. It has FTAs with various countries. Uh, I saw recently that there's a, a potential new uh, subsidy investigation concerning Chinese EVs. So how, how do you think the, the EU FCR, the foreign subsidies regulation, will interlock, if at all, with those existing uh, provisions? Yeah, I think here we have um, some uh, problems because it doesn't like fit into the existing system. There is a provision, um, Article 44.9 of the FSR, which says um, the FSR should not lead to a violation of the EU's obligations under international law. And there are um, indeed um, a huge, there is a huge um, amount of, of very, very comprehensive free trade agreements between the EU and third countries. A lot of these agreements contain provisions on subsidies, on state aid. Some of them go very, very far, some of a bit less. But I think it should have been obvious, and we pointed this out during the consultation process, um, there should be some mechanism to um, reflect this. So I think the best idea would have been to create some type of safe harbor, like a white list to be set up, where basically these countries which have a comprehensive free trade agreement, which includes subsidy rules, these are basically um, countries um, which do not have to deal with the FSR tools. Um, so that is something the commission did not um, introduce, obviously. Um, we also suggested to at least introduce some type of gray list. So even if you uh, have a uh, not so perfect system in your FTA with the European Union, at least um, this uh, could lead to a softening of reporting requirements. Uh, such an approach, I think, uh, would have streamlined the notification process. It uh, would also have allowed the Commission to use the limited resources for important cases. And I think the most important point, um, it would have encouraged third countries to enter into FTAs, free trade agreements, with the EU, which um, yeah, allows the EU basically to export, to export their state aid rules. But the Commission didn't follow these ideas could have been advantageous as you say so you consider that failure to take on board those type of comments to be a bit of a design flaw in the uh, in the um, FCR FSR I think so yeah that's just true that's about the major design flaw um, I think is a good expression <laughs> design flaw is that um, the notion of um, subsidies and in particular the notion of financial contribution is so wide. I mean, it's very, very wide. And so a lot of stuff comes within the scope um, of the um, FSR in the end. And these are often just, you know, contracts um, with governments, uh, which are concluded at arm's length prices. And so I don't really understand why they have to be reviewed, these type of measures. Yeah, I think a lot of people agree with that. <laughs> um, and finally, on the substance, Ulrich, um, we, we've talked a bit about appeals, but um, of course, in, a, in mergers and procurements, we, we see a lot of litigation in Luxembourg before the European courts. Do you think this is going to um, be another fruitful area, at least for the lawyers, in terms of... Um, uh, litigation in Luxembourg. I would think so. Um, very similar, like in state aid law, uh, we can expect that these fights are going to be continued in the courts in Luxembourg. So it's always like competitors and their lawyers, as you said correctly, they will always test the boundaries. Um, they will always challenge positive decisions. I mean, there are some procedural hurdles to overcome, like the admissibility test and the local standee interest in legal proceedings and so on. But I think 
at least it can be quite a nuisance, such a um, appeal. And also, of course, the subsidy recipients uh, who have received a negative decision, they will go to Luxembourg. Um, so the game will go on lots of work for lawyers and so good news. All right. Well, thank you, Ulrich. That's a very uh, fascinating discussion on a topic we got to revisit, and I bet we'll be revisiting it again in the future. Um, but now uh, we want to turn to a section of the podcast where we put you on the spot to ask you a few personal questions. Um, so to start off, can you tell us something interesting about yourself that we wouldn't know if we only knew you professionally? Interesting, yeah. I'm I'm sorry, I have to disappoint you here. So I don't have any hidden secrets or something. Married to the same person. I'm going out for 20 years now. 20 years with the same firm now. Um, no exceptional hobbies. Don't write poems. Don't write crime <laughs> stories or anything like that. And don't run a heavy metal band or anything. Um, so, um, but I uh, think there's one thing which just came to me um, the other day when I was discussing with a friend recently about the. Uh, current success in Europe, which we have of the right wing and uh, of the populist national forces everywhere. Um, I think it's a sort of intriguing thing about my family. My grandfather, he was Austrian and he, um, his family always lived in Bohemia, like close to Prague, basically. Um, and he had no less than uh, four nationalities uh, successively, so one after uh, the other. Because his father was serving in the army in Hungary as an Austrian, Kosici, which is now Slovak Republic. He um, was born as a Hungarian, so hence uh, my Hungarian name. Then he switched back to Austrian. I don't know why, actually. I um, cannot really establish that for whatever reason. After the whole region then, Sudetenland, is called in German, um, became part of Czechoslovakia, and so he became Czech. Um, and just before World War II, when Hitler took over the Sudetenland, he became German. So four nationalities are quite complicated. I find this interesting because it sort of, I think it highlights how this whole concept of nationality here means uh, often quite little. In, in reality, it's often based on yeah, historical coincidences, I think, and uh, sometimes even on opportunistic moves by individuals. So I, I personally find it hard to understand against this background um, that uh, certain parties in Europe still nowadays uh, can base a whole ideology on this idea, um, I hope this is not um, too political for your podcast, sorry, but I think we uh, should all know better in the meantime. No, that's that's very interesting. And I think it uh, is a nice way to cap off this episode where we're talking about the European Union and, and that ethos, um, which is sort of... Uh, the idea of one Europe and and uh, eschewing the idea of, of of nationality. So I think I think that's an interesting anecdote. Um, one last question: We want to turn to a segment in our podcast that we like to call the Curious Hat. And now it's time for the Curious Hat. Uh, so Ulrich, the way the Curious Hat works is we have a virtual uh, hat. And when we did this in person, we used to have a, a physical hat, and we pull a question out of the hat um, to ask you. So I'm pulling up our list now and, and picking a random question. And today's question is, are you a cat person or a dog person or neither? And why? Both. Definitely both. Um, we have three cats at home. My wife acquired them. I never had um, pets when I was young. Um, and we have a dog. They get along quite well, mostly. And um, I have to say, I discussed this in depth, actually, like three days ago with my daughter and my son, and I don't have any preference. So a lot of good arguments in favor of cats, a lot of good arguments in favor of dogs. So I'm, I'm both. And what type of dog do you have? It's actually, it's a Bolonka Zvetna. It's like a small, like, it's, it's only five kilograms. It's tiny. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, really you. appreciated the discussion today. And thank you to our listeners for listening to this episode of Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. 
It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at, at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.